Good evening, everybody. I'm going to get us started in a few minutes. I see that people are still rolling in, so I'm going to give it another minute or two and then we'll get started. Okay, good evening, and welcome to the first great talk of the great pandemic, and our first to be held entirely online. I am William Eginton, director of the Alexander Grass Humanities Institute at Johns Hopkins, and your host for this evening's event, Stem Cells, Assessing Cutting Edge Genes, Gene Design and Therapies. I want to begin by thanking Claudine Davidson, creator of the nonprofit speaker series, Great Talk, for her tireless, not to say relentless, pursuit of the goal, also written into our motto at Johns Hopkins, of knowledge for the world. I also want to thank Eve Fogelstein, president of Great Talk, for her terrific work in making this return a reality. Finally, I want to give special thanks to Shira Dingle, who makes it all happen here at the Alexander Grass Humanities Institute. Now, to introduce our panel. Eric Green is the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Green has been at the Institute for more than 25 years, during which he has had multiple key leadership roles. He served as the Institute's scientific director for seven years, chief of its genome technology branch for 13 years, and, founding, and is and was founding director of the NIH Intramural Sequencing Center. Diane Hoffman, has been on the faculty at Maryland since 1987, where she's taught torts, law and medicine, healthcare law, legal problems of the elderly, critical issues in healthcare, research with human subjects, and healthcare for the poor. She was a primary author of Maryland's Healthcare Decisions Act and has served as a member of a number of ethics committees, including those at University of Maryland Medical Systems, the National Institutes of Health, and the VA Medical Center in Baltimore. Tony Winshaw Boris, is president of the American Society for Human Genetics. He was appointed to the National Advisory Health, uh, Child Health and Human Development Council of the NIH in 2019. He is also a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation, the Association of American Physicians, the American Pediatric Society, and is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Antonio Regalado is the senior editor for biomedicine from MIT Technology Review with a focus on how technology is changing medicine and biomedical research. Many of Antonio's articles have also been included in the Genetic Literacy Project. Before joining the MIT Technology Review in July 2011, Antonio lived in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where he wrote about science, technology, and politics in Latin America for the journal Science and other publications. From 2000 to 2009, Antonio was the science reporter at the Wall Street Journal. I have a number of questions intended to spark discussion among our panel members. And I also welcome questions from the audience, which you can send to me via the chat function on Zoom. So without further ado, let me turn to our panel with a question ripped from the headlines, as it were. As reported in multiple news outlets, and in fact, a story that Antonio himself broke, while the company Re Regeneron, quote, did not directly use human fetal cells to make the monoclonal antibody treatment given to President Trump, it did use cells derived from an abortion in the Netherlands back in 1972, end quote. What lessons can we draw about the overlapping and potential interference between cultural and religious politics and scientific advancement? Are there in fact lessons here or just political noise? So I'm with that going to turn to our panel and ask for anyone who feels like it to jump in and, and start conversing amongst yourselves as well. Would like I to might just make a comment about it. Uh, if you can hear me, I'd make a comment about the story because it actually did start as political noise. There was sort of some traffic on Twitter about how um, Regeneron, this company that developed the antibody that President Trump got, had used embryonic stem cells in their research. And it was tweeted by Ted Lieu, a, a congressman from California. Um, so that was interesting. They were trying to make this gotcha moment about the embryonic stem cells, but that was wrong because embryonic, human embryonic stem cells were not used in this particular research. Uh, there was kind of a confusion, but that prompted me to look into it. And so it turns out there's a very old cell line, 30 years old, 40 years old, 
that was originally derived from abortion tissue that was used in the research for the testing of the antibodies. And that resulted in a series of articles that were a kind of a gotcha because the administration has tried to curtail research on abortion tissue. Um, so that was the contrast between the emergency treatment for the president uh, versus what is the pol policy position of the administration about that kind of research to study those cells, potentially derive new cell lines. It strikes me just a quick follow up, Antonio, and anyone else feel feel free to jump in at this point, but that um, what your reporting revealed was that there was an attempt at a got you on one side that turned into kind of a, a reverse got you. But uh, the, the question of the distinction between embryonic and um, and the, the, the old line that was in fact used, is this an important distinction in anything other than sort of political debates right now? Uh, is this something that we should be paying attention to? Is this a, a, a distinction that has scientific value to it, that has ethical uh, value to it? Or again, does this more or less register at the level of noise? Well, from the point of view of, uh, I won't weigh in on the political aspects. Others, others of you can probably do better than that. But from the scientific aspects, you know, if we go back several decades, there was a time when one couldn't grow any types of cells in culture, which were, would be a very important advance when it happened for a variety of different uh, applications, not least of which were at the time to grow cells that would allow one to make polio virus, to make vaccines for polio 60, 70 years ago. And so the ability to do that actually opened up a uh, field. And some of those types of cells, simply because they're easier to grow, because they come from embryos, have come from from embryos. Others came from cancerous tissue because those cancers were able to grow um, as, as cancer does in the body, but also sometimes can be adapted to grow in petri dishes on a tissue culture plate. So those advances were so important uh, many years ago and there wasn't the, you know, the social and political debates that there are now and the gotcha uh, uh, aspects of, of, uh, of what may be happening today. Uh, and so as those cell lines were established, some of them became ones that were used by everybody. I'm sure Eric can comment, uh, Dr. Green can comment on the HeLa cells and, and maybe that would be something to discuss uh, that were developed in the 1950s. So uh, there was a different feeling about things in those days and it was just an important avenue to try to grow viruses for vaccines. And of course, COVID-19 or SARS, CoV-2 is exactly the same kind of virus as, as, uh, as one, would, uh, one would need tissue culture in order to grow them up in, um, in uh, sort of a larger amount to make vaccines. In this case, it was to make antibodies as well. So these are scientific tools that we use. The, the political and social aspects of it, of course, are arising today because of our uh, polarization. But, but to really build on what Tony said, I, I think it's important to appreciate um, sort of a practical issue that comes out of this. And maybe as the, the head of, a, of an organization that funds research, I have to get practical because money is precious. It's taxpayer money. We need to capitalize on our investment that the public uh, gives us money to, to do biomedical research. And one of the challenges that comes up in these circumstances and you know, forget the politics, forget the gotcha, let's just be practical, is when you, these tools, as Tony called them, these cell lines, you know, millions of dollars have been invested in characterizing them, refining them, getting them properly calibrated for use in biomedical research. And so the dilemma that we all have to encounter, both the scientists and society at the same time, is when we come up against a circumstance where um, maybe in the current light of day, it is thought and people can, you know, reasonable people can disagree. It's unethical because they were derived from fetal tissue, et cetera, et cetera. If it's an existing tool for which considerable public investment of NIH dollars or other funders dollars have gone into it, should, should there be a halt on the use of that mature tool because of its origins that were created at a time where was the different view? And, and so that's the, and, and Tony, uh, you know, rightly pointed out, HeLa cells are a great example. And I mean, we're, we're, this is coming out of Maryland, this whole program, and it's very relevant 
uh, because the HeLa cells were derived in Baltimore, in fact, and it's one of the most heavily used cell lines. And in today's view, you know, inappropriately uh, derived at the time. Uh, but, you know, that was a whole different era. And, and, and yet the idea that we would stop using HeLa cells now would be tragic and would actually cripple many important scientific projects. So we, in these current circumstances, we often have to sort of weigh um, past things that we may not find appropriate. And we can decide in a different way whether people can argue whether they're appropriate or not, but that's some people may deem it. But what do you do with the materials or the reagent of the tool that is not only just used today, it's used widely today and significant investment has been made to make it an effective tool. Very good point. Can I, can I just jump in? I mean, I, I don't know that there's a, a weighty ethical issue about an abortion that occurred 40 years ago, but uh, there are industries that, you know, invest in different tools, the makeup industry, uh, you know, they have tests, various types of assays that they use, you know, using rabbits. And then people say, well, we don't want you to put the makeup in the eyes of rabbits. It's cruel. And they could mount a similar argument. Uh, well, no, uh, we've invested so much in these procedures, and yet there, there can still build an ethical argument uh, that could be, you know, then then science could provide an answer. It's like, well, there could be an alternative. So mm. I, I don't know that we should rule out the possibility of alternatives if, if the scientific uh, uh, community decide to put their minds to it. Perhaps an equivalent cell line could be uh, developed from some other. And, and in that particular, in, in that general theme, although it's not in, it's not something my institute does specifically, other institutes at NIH, there are significant efforts ongoing at NIH to develop alternate models to the use of animals, for example, um, mm -hmm. in those cities. You know, are there other, are there other ways to develop assays that give you the same kind of toxicity information that you may want to have about new cosmetics or new other products? that are being tested to try to decrease the amount of animal research. Whether we'll ever get it down to zero, we don't know. But, and I, but I think, again, I think uh, the public is, is actually happy to see NIH trying to be creative and coming up with alternate ways to pursue research that maybe would involve in the long run, you know, a more uh, um, sophisticated approaches that don't require the use of, of whole animals, for example. I think that another issue that, or comes out of this is, is how much government or, or a halt or a blanket policy should be put in place versus informing uh, patients, consumers, users of the products and allowing them to make a decision. Uh, where do we put that line? And I think that's coming up a lot in lots of scientific issues now with industry wanting innovation and government wanting safety and efficacy and consumers wanting access. And those t three things are somewhat in tension in terms of how we consider these ethical issues. And Diane, I assume you would agree with my view that there's general consumers on the one hand, and then there's patients and patient advocates. And they speak with uh, a, a different, often louder and more passionate voice. Um, and it's very interesting navigating uh, between the different communities. I'm sure Tony has seen this as a human geneticist as well. Uh, no one gets more energized and more, more interested in motivating you as a scientist than a, a, a parent of a patient with a rare disease or a, a disease community, advocacy community. Uh, there is significant passion to, and they, they view the world very differently than your average you know, reasonably healthy uh, health consumer. Right. And, and we're at a time, too, when a lot of things are coming, uh, you know, coinciding with this in terms of things like right to try legislation and um, the consumers pushing for access to non-proven therapies, which is something that we can talk more about. But this is um, an interesting time in terms of, of trust of regulators and or lack of trust and uh, wanting to not wanting the government in some ways to be an intermediary. Now that's only some, so, some groups. Uh, certainly there's uh, still a, a lot of folks who definitely want that uh, role that the FDA and other government agencies have to uh, assure safety and efficacy of the products that are on the market. Well, the overlap or the potential conflict between two of those um, 
competing, potentially competing uh, uh, motivations actually comes up in the story that, uh, that Antonio um, broke in a way, right? Is that on the one hand, Trump represents a constituency that would be on moral and religious grounds exceedingly opposed to the use of, of fetal tissue for these purposes. On the other hand, he's been trumpeting a kind of um, freedom and, and deregulatory stance towards, in fact, his own treatment saying, you know, I'm just going and trying for him. Uh, and and look, gee, how it's working for me. Isn't it? Isn't it better that I'm I'm out here doing this? And in a way, he's trying to. Uh, again, I don't know how conscious he was of the decision at the time of where the the drugs came from. Probably not, Antonio. Right? So, so, I can't say for certain, but yeah. but I doubt it. I mean, he uh, he didn't utter the word biotechnology until two years into his term. Did not yeah. utter the word. As far as I know, has never said stem cell, has never said CRISPR, has never said gene editing. So he couldn't be further from these like cutting edge issues in biotechnology and the social questions. I mean, could not be further. Mm -hmm. And I think he's clearly shown he's not so happy about the coronavirus um, that has had, you know, he's had, instead of talking about what he wants to talk about, he's talking about coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the lead to our story, you know, we kind of let him have it. We said, you know, he came out of the hospital and he said, wow, I got these great treatments. They were like miracles coming from God. And we said, well, if, if that's true, then God uses, in a, you know, abortion derived cell line. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no kind of policy view on these things from Trump himself that we know of. Um, but he's created a lot of space for interest groups that are traditionally kind of on the conservative side of, of uh, of the political picture that include pro-life groups whose objective very specifically is to um, carry the abortion fight into the scientific domain by objecting to or curtailing research on human embryonic stem cells from embryos or abortion derived tissue from you know recent abortions. So I don't think that he actually knew that that was happening. Uh, so there you get the gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> well, since we've um, started to broach certain ethical questions here, let me uh, segue on to another question. As uh, most here will know, if not all, American geneticist Jennifer Doudna just became one of two women to form the first all-woman team to win the Nobel Prize in chemistry for her work with Emmanuel Charpentier in developing CRISPR. As biographer Walter Isaacson recently wrote, CRISPR raises some tough moral questions. The questions he goes on to list are in some ways perfect fodder for this panel of experts. One, he says, should we edit our species to make us less susceptible to deadly viruses? He passes on sort of in each, each level of the question, sort of pushing the, uh, pushing the potential border for moral confrontation further and further. If we agree, and I assume he would assume most would, to that first premise, if we should agree if we agree we should eliminate diseases like Huntington's sickle cell and cystic fibrosis, what about congenital deafness or blindness or being short or being depressed? And then finally pushing the envelope, are there then limits on what should be changeable in our children, for example? Should we allow parents to change the IQ and strength of their kids, choose gender, eye color, skin tone? I know there's a lot of complexities, there's a lot of science that's perhaps being brushed over by these questions. So I'd like us both to talk about the potential ethical conundrums that Walter Isaacson raises, but also uh, perhaps to bring into, clear, into greater clarity some of the science that are behind the assumptions. Let me start and let me even try to be slightly more general even than talking about CRISPR, although I'd love to talk about CRISPR and uh, Jennifer is a grantee of my institute and we are extremely proud and delighted to see her win her, the Nobel Prize well deserved. And I think, um, but, but I, I do want to set a context here that I think might help sort of build out when we get to CRISPR is that the, the you know, the, the genome editing technology that CRISPR represents is just the latest of a series of tools that raise a number of ethical dilemmas. So this is not new. Um, and we could probably go, I don't know how far back in time to go. I'll go back to at least, again, I'm the, I'm the genomics person here. So I'm gonna stick with DNA a lot tonight. And you know, we just go back to the molecular biology revolution uh, that took place in the 1980s uh, when DNA started to be cloned and manipulated. And there was a lot of concern about recombinant DNA. That was the scare term, recombinant DNA. 
And what happened was that the scientific community um, uh, basically got together um, and they had a major conference at a, at a place called the Silomar. Some of the people may have heard about this and they put together basically guidelines by which you could use recombinant DNA. And it actually has served, I think, the scientific community well and um, it has sort of developed guardrails, not perfect guardrails, but pretty darn good guardrails whereby it was clear what was and was not appropriate. Sort of then fast forward to where I came on the scene professionally and that's in genomics and the Human Genome Project. And the, at that time, the idea of reading out the human blueprint, reading out the human genome sequence also scared some people. You know, it raised a whole host of ethical issues uh, and uh, that actually enabled the kind of things you just gave as possibilities whenever we got to the point of going beyond reading our DNA to actually being able to edit our DNA. And well, what happened with the Human Genome Project and what happened with the field of genomics was we established essentially on day one of the Genome Project, major research initiatives all under the umbrella of something called the Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Research Program, which also called ELSI, E-L-S-I. And, and clearly many issues have come up and continue to come up and will into the future. Many, and, and in fact, we will see it as better tools and technologies come on board. But not only was it important for scientists to be involved in sort of helping to frame the conversation and developing collaborations with, with legislators and with policymakers and, and with people like Diane and her colleagues as well to have that dialogue. But it was also very important for us to be doing the research, investing, and that's what their LC research program is. Our institute dedicates 5% of all of its research dollars to studying the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomic advances. Guess what? We now give grants exactly looking at the kind of issues you just raised so that when we have these conversations, we can meld together what is scientifically possible to what is the body of evidence that has come out when we have looked at these LC issues, these bioethical issues, and then have conversations with policymakers, legislature, the general public, advocacy groups, patient groups, and so forth, and try to come to consensus on what should the guardrails look like here. But we should also not let ourselves get too far over our skis as to what might be possible when scientifically they're nowhere near being possible. And even the list that you Led, read there, some of these things one could imagine and some of these things are, are, are fanciful that we just can't even imagine, for example, how to use CRISPR technology to substantially change people's height, for example, even if we wanted to do that. But in any case, I just want to make sure we realize there's a framework here where I think scientists and molecular biologists, geneticists, genomicists have responsibly not only been willing to discuss this and help develop frameworks for proceeding with the science, but also to study the ethical implications of these advances to make sure we're poised to have the most sophisticated conversations. Well, I think this is extremely helpful because as I indicated before, it's not necessarily clear to the lay public, myself included, what is currently possible, what is imminently possible, and what is more at the remains at the level of pipe dreams at the moment or, or potentialities that, that aren't right around the corner. Um, I gather in that ever-growing list that Isaacson cites of potential, potentially thorny ethical problems that as he moves down that list, one is further kind of moving further and further out into a futuristic uh, uh, mode of thinking. At the same time, there have been actual ethical within certain communities, say um, uh, the deaf community, uh, there have been ethical questions raised about making choices for future generations um, that might involve taking them out of a community where they might have been at home, for example, right? And, and I think whether or not you agree with that as someone not a part of that community, one has to grant that these are, have become certainly very real issues, right? So the, from the scientific uh, technical point of view, as, as Eric said, CRISPR is only one of the latest tools to allow one to approach changing particular sequences in all of the uh, billions of base pairs in each of our DNA. And that's and, it, and it's actually relatively straightforward to use. I think many labs, if not most labs use it, my own lab uses it in cells and tissue culture, stem cells as a matter of fact. Um, and so um, it's possible and it will be refined in a way that it can probably be used for scientific questions to alter a single base pair in a genome and then compare 
two cell types, one with a normal or a non-disease base pair and one with a base pair that causes the disease. So that's something we can do today. Mm. So then, uh, th then the next question might be, well, now if we can do that today, what can we do about certain diseases? So let's just take one example. Let's take sickle cell disease that's caused by a single base pair substitution in a gene for beta globin, and it causes the, the globin molecule to be misfolded when uh, the oxygen tension goes down and clogs up the vessels and causes a various, very serious disease. We've known that pathophysiology for 70, 80 years. We've known that that's what's happened. We haven't been able to do anything about it. So people today are using that technology, that CRISPR technology, but they could use any other technology to alter a particular base pair in patients that have diseases like sickle cell disease to cure it. Now, not in every cell in their body, but in the particular cells where the disease occurs, that is the bone marrow stem cells. So we have a, we're a stem cell session. We'll just talk about stem cells for a second. Mm -hmm. So you can take a patient's stem cells out, manipulate them, change the gene, alter it in a way to met now either make it normal or make the expression normal, give the patient their own bone marrow back. It doesn't get passed on to the next generation. In fact, the person will still have children that are at risk of having sickle cell disease. So there's one step toward using it to, to modify disease genes. The, then the other end of the spectrum, in again, this simple example would be to alter it in that person's sperm and eggs so that they don't ever pass it on to their children. That's, that's not something we can do today easily, in, certainly in human beings. So, so I'm, I'm not suggesting that we do that. But the point is that if you could target a particular tissue, in this case, stem cells, adult stem cells, you can actually have some impact on that disease. And that I think people would feel would be a reasonable use of the technology, stem cells and our knowledge of the disease process to move forward. And you can make other examples as well. So that's just talking, talking about it from the science point of view. And, and uh, uh, we could talk about then some of the other examples that you gave from uh, the Isaacson article. I'd be happy to jump in on that. Uh, I mean, the CRISPR tool or gene editing tools, if you apply them to an embryo, the, the first cell of an embryo, the zygote, I, I don't know if it's rightly called the stem cell, but it, as if it were, it creates all the other cells of the body. Um, so that's kind of the ultimate cell to apply it to. And then the change is in the whole being. I think that that's that's what he's referring to. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, it is a technology that could be used to change heredity. And then to Trump's point, you know, we are as gods if we're changing our own genetic makeup. I think uh, sometimes I have a trick where if I wanna get, you know, a clear scientific answer to what's possible or what's interesting to do, I get away from the human question and I go talk to the animal science people who are working with pigs and cattle because they don't have these ethical questions. And I've just been doing that today and they're very busy engineering pigs with CRISPR to resist pig respiratory viruses, pig coronaviruses, African swine fever, which is killing pigs in China. So, you know, it turns out that scientists find, you know, this or that change to this or that receptor that you can make and, and the virus just no longer has a purchase on, on the animal. Um, and so they're very busy installing these small genetic changes to make these animals resistant to these diseases. And this concept has also, in the, in, you know, in the context of a global pandemic, some people have floated the idea, you know, we need to develop this technology, ethically problematic or not, because th there could be a pandemic which is way worse than COVID-19, you know, black death times two, and then we might need recourse to this engineering of our own species to, you know, um, create people who are not, do not suffer this disease. And I'm not just, say, I, I'm not just saying this, this is actually, I'm quoting George Daly, who is sort of, has been the chief of the whole stem cell field in many ways for the last decade. Um, you know, it's a flexibility to confront future threats because we have the power to alter our own genomes. And that is one way to defeat the virus. You know, you can do it to a pig, you could do it to a person. It is far out, um, but you know, that's one of the ideas that's out there. I just want to add on to that, Antonio. So totally agree with these uh, experiments being done in animals and just how you say it, being done in the fertilized egg 
so that they can uh, it can be something passed on to other generations. And in fact, we use it um, in my own department at uh, in order to make animal models of particular diseases. So you can think about using it to resist viruses, or you can say, I wanna make a model of sickle cell anemia in mice. So these are things that you can use this technology for. So you're absolutely right. It's only a, a small step to go to do that in humans. So you know, one way to think about it might be that it is a good thing that it's being done in animals so we can figure out the safety and, and, and all the other aspects to what we might want to use eventually in humans while, as Eric was mentioning, uh, we would discuss <laughs> what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing in human beings. And I think that's the next step. The technology can be developed, animal models, cells and culture I described first for, for using it for model systems, for correcting it for other, other aspects, but we have to address the, obviously the uh, ethical and uh, legal and social aspects of it as well. And that's, I think, I think where Diane comes in, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think we all can agree on, I think most of us can agree on the, the benefits of creating uh, resistance to certain diseases, to most diseases. But of course, the, the difficult questions are like the ones that um, Bill, you raised in the initial question about uh, height and eye color and IQ and all of those things. That's where people start to think about eugenics and um, justice issues and access issues. And is this just gonna be something that the rich have access to and issues of health, dis even if we're you know, just about disease resistance and, and health disparities, uh, how are we going to uh, decide who, would get, who gets that? Uh, and interesting questions about, should the physician be the gatekeeper? Um, you, know, you don't have a right to any uh, medical treatment that you want, you have to go to a willing provider uh, and are they uh, willing to provide it and insurance willing to cover it? Uh, all of those things will be uh, part of that discussion for sure. Um, and I, I think it, it raises some fascinating issues about even if, if people, if it becomes the norm to do this, to it's like vaccinating your child, instead we you need to make sure that they get this treatment mm -hmm. or do this so that your, uh, your children and their uh, heirs don't um, uh, develop these diseases. If you don't do that, is there going to be a penalty or a, an assumption that you are neglecting your children or, um, do we report you for that? <coughs> it, it, it raises just so many issues that I know, um, Eric, you are, your grantees are dealing with in the, the LC um, uh, projects that they're working on. Um, and there's not easy answers to this. But by the way, I, I should point out it's a slight diversion because we're moving away from animal, we're moving away from you know mammals. To, to, to insects, but you know, the concept of, of changing a species in an attempt for a public health reason is being tested at this whole concept of gene drive, where they take mosquitoes and using CRISPR and other engineering technology to make them so that they are incapable of carrying the malarial parasite and as a means to try to decrease the spread of malaria. And you know, this would have incredible implications if successful in places like Africa and other parts of the world. Um, of course, you gotta be careful because you also don't wanna do anything. Un it's the unintended consequences that we're so concerned about. And you know, you're releasing mosquitoes in the wild, but, you know, something doesn't go well, you're a little nervous about that. If you're doing this for a human being, you know, you're a little bit nervous about unintended consequences. You know, in the case of the pigs that are gonna be used for food products or harvest in some ways, you know, if, you know, all of a sudden they don't, there's some other thing. Maybe it's a more controlled circumstance because you're not putting them back out in the wild. But but you know these are all you know the, there are incredibly exciting opportunities and then some daunting scientific opportunities and then some distasteful aspects to some of these things. Some of it related to unintended consequences. And unintended consequences. That's a great point too because some of the things we've been discussing sound like uh, things that we would all support. That is uh, eliminating infectious disease, eliminating. Uh, sickle cell anemia, but in fact, there are certain um, 
uh, it's felt, and there's good evidence for it, for sickle cell anemia being a carrier, not having the disease itself protects against malaria. Mm. So that if you eliminated the sickle cell gene, you might in increase susceptibility to malaria in Mediterranean and African populations. And the other part of that is there are genes that are involved in uh, HIV uh, entry into the cell, and some individuals don't have that receptor, and then they don't, uh, aren't susceptible to infection. And so that can be done as well, but nobody knows the secondary consequences. That heterozygous carrier state might protect against certain other infectious diseases by having or being a carrier. So getting rid of that gene might be a problem. So unintended consequences are things we always have to think about and discuss. Yeah, you know, and on the on the related to cell biology and stem cells and so forth, we haven't heard about much of this lately. But you know, I vividly remember when Dolly the sheep was cloned, and that created all sorts of of debate and discussions in the in society, appropriately so. And I remember I, I had the pleasure of actually um, uh, participating in a in a big multi day symposium with uh, Ian Wilmot, who was the scientist who led the, the creation of, of 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 Dolly the sheep. And uh, what I hadn't appreciated, he told me, and it really is really important to recognize is, you know, that wasn't a very healthy sheep. Yeah. It had a lot of serious, you know, didn't live as long as it should have had serious arthritis issues as, as it grew up. It was not, it was not a healthy animal. You know, and all of a sudden everybody's thinking, oh, well, we should be cloning people. I mean, you know, the, there are going to be massive unintended consequences yeah. of just because you have a tool and you can accomplish something, you know, over the a normal lifespan, you may see things you never anticipated. And Dolly was not a healthy specimen. I have a, a number of questions that have started to come in from the audience, and because they, in some cases, ride uh, directly upon the coattails of the conversation that we're having, I think it might make sense for me to, uh, to read through them and basically give you the selection. So, uh, so if, if one of these questions strikes you as something that you'd like to, to dive in on, please do right away. So uh, a first question, can we really categorize what happened to Henrietta Lacks as, social or political t uh, as a social or political type consideration? Likewise, can we ignore the relationship between social issues and equities and science, given the history of how science is, has advanced by exploiting disenfranchised people, for example, black men and women? And does still, when you consider the type of things pharma and other science research entities are doing in Africa and other third world nations, Consent is now required for use of some things pertaining to people's bodies, but how fully informed are patients made, again, going back to those disenfranchised or less educated? What counts as informed? What is informed? That's one question. I'll, I'll, I'll read two of them and then we'll get back to, to, to you and then I can go further down the list uh, a little bit later. The ethical issues of fetal cell followed by stem cell research have been studied and debated since the 1980s. 20 years ago, we engaged these issues in Nebraska where I was a public spokesperson for a pro-research advocacy group. I'm interested to know where we stand now with respect to the development of cures and therapies based on HESC and IPSC. Thank you. So that's maybe something that some of the scientists can clarify for us. I would like to make a comment just from the position as, as the journalist. At the time, this questioner was working in Nebraska. I was working as a journalist covering the stem cell debate, the great embryonic stem cell debate, mm -hmm. which preoccupied uh, George Bush Jr. in his first year in office. Uh, and you know, a lot of promises were made for embryonic stem cells. California, two thousand four, put in place the. Uh, the uh, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, I think, which was a $3 billion project, um, you know, with the promise of embryonic stem cells being the answer, uh, ironically, they have uh, migrated towards the position of their opponents, which is the actual stem cell that's useful, most often is the blood stem cell, the hem hem hematopoietic stem cell, just because it's a cell you can get out of the body you can change it and you can get it back in. It's a kind of a liquid state. It moves around and you, it goes where you want. So I found that very interesting. Most of the grants from this institute set up to do embryonic stem cell research, when they had to show some results, they actually moved to into the hematopoietic system primarily. So as a journalist, I don't know of any treatments um, they're on the market using embryonic stem cells and under in the clinic, I would guess that there might be just one or two right now. So the one example, so in terms of taking uh, embryonic stem cells and implanting them back or taking a patient cells, making 
induce pluripotent stem cells out of their skin cells and giving it back to them to make a tissue. There's that you're you're correct. I mean, there's there is there are a lot of people working on this top this problem, and there's been some success. There have been tracheas made, skin cell grafts have been made with cells derived from patient, you know, patient cells. So there are some successes, but part of it is we just don't understand the tissues themselves. But one place where I think there is, there certainly has been some success is that if you can take a patient's cell types, turn them into these embryo-like cells, these induced pluripotent stem cells that has a particular disease, then you can test those cells in using drug screens or other things to activate genes or turn off genes. And those sort of drug screens can then lead to therapy, uh, therapies that then could be used in the patient. So it's an indirect way of using these cells. So I think that that has been, that part has been successful in modeling. Uh, those have been very successful. I'll just give you one small example. I, uh, my whole career, I was studying mouse as a model system for early brain development because most of the things that happen in a mouse brain happen in a very early human brain. But it turns out once we learned more about the human brain, there are types of cells in the developing human brain that aren't present in the mouse that you can't study in the mouse. So only by deriving stem cells from humans and, and then making them differentiate into brain cells could you study those cells in a tissue culture plate. And so, so there's an example where using stem cell technology to learn something about a cell type that you can't really study in any other way, and then maybe will be part of diseases. You know, I think those are the ways that we're, that we're gonna make progress today, but I think the, the potential uh, is, is certainly still great. It's just gonna take longer than we all thought. We're impatient, but, but it does take patience, unfortunately. You know, what I, what I find striking about uh, many of these issues, maybe I'm getting old, but, uh, or, or maybe it's just experience, I don't know which, but it's, it's how much our frame of thinking changes over different periods of time. So we go back to HeLa, the HeLa example. You know, it, it, you know, just informed consent just wasn't part of the milieu at the time. Now we could look back and think these people were horrible and all these things were wrong, but it just wasn't part of the fabric of what went on. So, so, but now informed consent is a much more, you know, well-appreciated, well-respected, deeply ingrained. You know, I think about, another example I think about, I think about, you know, when the Human Genome Project started, we were all working with DNA clones, pieces of DNA that had been cloned either into bacterial cells, of, and they had human DNA either in bacterial cells or yeast cells. And everybody knew the person whose DNA it was because there were only a handful of libraries and inevitably it was the person who knew how to make those clones that they use their DNA because they just said, oh, I'll just use my DNA. You know, nowadays we would never do that. In fact, when we actually got a little bit into the Human Genome Project, we said, wait a second, we've got to be really careful how we go about picking the DNA we're going to sequence when we sequence the first human genome. It has to be somebody anonymous and it can't just be somebody who was just, you know, right there making the clones themselves. So it, with nowadays we would laugh at that. I, actually, a conversation came up just this afternoon. Uh, with my son, who's a 24-year-old doing clinical research now in his last year before probably going to medical school next year. But he's doing clinical research and he was making the comment that he's mostly doing uh, computer, computer analysis of, 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 of data about patients in a healthcare system. And he said he can't believe how incredibly careful all the physicians and the genetic counselors are in, in monitoring how any of the data is used or handled or who speaks about it, who can access it. He says, it, it actually just, he can't believe how careful they are. And I said, you know, it's so interesting because when I was in medical school, which wasn't that long ago, it was a while ago, but you know, or maybe Tony agrees with me when he was in medical school, we were just much freer in talking about patients and, you know, calling patients and could be out information with, or talking about it with colleagues. And now I look back on what we did as medical, what I did as medical, even what I did as a resident. And it's like, oh my gosh, this would never be allowed now because there's all these protections that have come in place, all for good reasons. I don't think I was an evil medical student, nor do I think that people that trained me as a medical student were evil, horrible people who talked more freely and shared more clinical information about their patients. They just wouldn't do it now. It's just not the appropriate thing to be doing now. So I think in all of these situations, we have to recognize we're getting better at a lot of these things. And yes, genetics carries this incredible weight of past horrible things that went on. And we absolutely have to constantly remind ourselves of that. But we also have to say, we don't do that now. 
And we don't do some things perfect now, but we'll get better. And I do think we keep getting better at, at bringing sort of social equity, social justice to the kind of work that we're doing. And if I could pick up on the that the question of informed consent that the, the questioner raised and um, Eric's response. I, certainly we have done a lot and we've come a long way. I just recently taught the the Moore case in my torts class for my students and and now physicians are required to disclose conflicts of interest when they are using any kind of materials that they're obtaining from a patient uh, for research purposes that may uh, inure to their, to their benefit and, and certain kinds of uh, profit-making ventures. But I guess I wanna kind of hone in on whether we should be doing more on this whole question of disparities, which I think was part of the questioners um, uh, it was, Diane, and there's a follow-up, in fact, so maybe I can throw in the follow-up and you can speak to that. It says, uh, I'm, I'm reading, uh, just to, to get in a, a very topical part of the question, part of the serious concern is how majority culture tries to make science seem like it has not, has no bias, that it's just about the technical aspects of science, indiscriminate of other social factors. History does not, this is what the questioner is suggesting, history does not support that lack of bias in science. In other words, how can, yes, we can say we're getting better, but how can we be sure that informed consent is truly informed now given social inequities, et cetera? Yeah. Go ahead. Exactly. Uh, yes. I think, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I just think that we need to be thinking harder about what we should be doing. Should we, should part of informed consent include a group, group stigma related things? Should we be thinking because people have been uh, harmed by this, the healthcare system of, as being part of a vulnerable group, that they should get some priority uh, in receiving benefits from that system. This is becoming a, somewhat of a conversation with the allocation of the vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, and I, I, so I don't think we're, we're we've, we got a ways to go, I think, in terms of thinking more about um, these questions and how we can be more just in our allocation of, of medical resources and the benefits of the research that we're doing, whether it's genetics, stem cells, whatever. And it's not always a matter of us saying we're going to do things differently because sometimes, um, you know, it requires a, a partnership um, with research participants, for example. So for, I can tell you in the case of genomics and genetics research, we are very much trying to improve the representation of underrepresented groups in our participants as part of large uh, studies. Uh, and and, and it's, it's, a, it's a moral imperative that we do. And, and yet it turns out that, but we come into it with this burden of, it is not as easy to convince an underrepresented minority to participate in research because they don't trust, because the distrust, we lost their trust. We have to overcome our past problems uh, to bring them back into the and so, but and so as a result, it's a it's a it's a far more um, uh, it's, it's a bigger climb, it's a bigger lift to recruit, um, um, but it's doable. And I mean, I think if you look at some, you know, and and so and, you know, it's just inch by inch. It's really what it is. But if you look at you know major initiatives going on um, here in the United States, uh, you know, there's this big program, a population scale program called the All of Us Research Program. Um, which is a, a very large study that's going to go on for decades involving recruiting a million people to participate and sharing genomic data and health information about themselves and so forth. And there's an incredible commitment and an incredible success of making sure that that population of people brought into this, these participants be incredibly overrepresented for mm -hmm. uh, individuals who were previously were underrepresented in biomedical research. And it, it just takes a lot of really hard work and convincing and discussing, educating and, and being very patient, but it's doable and they're teaching us some very important lessons on how to, how to do exactly that. Can I jump in with a kind of uh, a contrary view? Um, since I'm a journalist, I guess I'm free to do it. I mean, NIH budget 5%, or at least Dr. Green's budget 5% set aside for ethical, legal, social issues. I just looked it up. I, th I think that HIV research is 10% of the overall NIH budget, is that right? Uh, certainly out of proportion to that disease's importance. I mean, we, we got incredible treatments that science delivered, 
Um, but if you tithe the scientific system uh, each time with interests that arise, um, you know, what's left uh, for science? I would throw that out there as a, a challenge, maybe for Anthony if he wants to take a uh, a question like well, that. Actually, before you do that, Antonio, I may I may throw gasoline on your fire and actually violently agree with you because actually I want to just clarify the numbers. My institute dedicates five percent of its research dollars to studying the ethical, legal, social implications of genomic advances. So it's five percent of an institute that's only one and a half percent of the NIH. Mm -hmm. No other NIH institute comes anywhere near 5% study bioethics. In fact, we are the largest block of bioethics dollars, research dollars at the NIH. So believe me, the amount of, I, I'd have to do the arithmetic, I can't do it quick enough, but trust me, it's well, 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 well under 1% of the NIH budget goes to bioethics research. Right, and then- Excuse me, Tony, I won't throw fire on it like Eric, uh, or gasoline on the fire like Eric did, uh, but I do agree that this is something that we have to, look at in every aspect of what we do. So in some ways, maybe um, it's misleading to think about the 5% to ethics in Eric's Institute and 10% to HIV. Uh, what we should think about is that if we're doing you, whatever we're using in terms of whatever percentage to study, some aspect of, that, of, of those studies have to be done on diverse, with, with diverse populations, on diverse populations, in partnership with our, with our diverse populations, whether that's HIV, ethics, COVID-19, whatever we have to do. So we have to be committed to that. But I think one of the things is uh, today, you know, we always look back at what we've done wrong and that's a good thing so that we could change some of the things that we're doing today. And I think our, the realization that we haven't done things correctly in the past, uh, uh, if we can face it, and we're not gonna solve the problem tomorrow but we have to make progress on it all the time. And I think that's what we have to be committed to. So that would be my, my response. I'm sorry to interrupt. Not at all. Oh, wonderful. I have a, a, a couple more audience questions that, um, that aren't too far afield from what we've been discussing. I think I'll, I'll throw them in in another batch of two. Um, one is a, sci a, a purely scientific uh, question or a question for about scientific possibilities. Although we might not yet have the ability to modify DNA to accomplish certain effects, don't we expect that every modification is possible in the long run? Would be one. So that's, I think, just something for the scientists maybe to, to, to clarify what our expectations are. And another about the funding of, um, of these developments is what are the potential conflicts of interest? And I imagine between private concerns, pharma and, and government funding. What needs to be communicated to the public that people can trust that this is in the best interest of the public? So two questions that, um, again, open to the whole panel, whoever wants to grab one and run with it. The first one, uh, I could just address it, I think relatively simply, uh, absolutely right. Theoretically, any, any base pair in the genome can probably be altered by one technology or another. There's probably some limitations but uh, yeah, theoretically, that's something that's not un that would that that you could think would be the case. I would think, Eric, you agree? No, I, no, I agree with that. But let's let's remember that some diseases, some traits, are really simple. You're just looking at sort of influencing the spelling of a single gene. But many, 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 many traits and many, 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 many diseases are incredibly complicated, and it's not a single spelling difference in one gene. It's multiple spelling differences spread out across multiple different genes, and 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 you know just going in and being able to recreate circumstances, um, but through engineering that involve many many changes are, are just not technically feasible yet. Maybe someday, but just not technically feasible yet. Plus environment. So and, and then of course there's there's so not just the genes. It's also the influence of environment. So. And, and the other thing we're learning, and believe me, it's still uh, many aspects of this are a black box, is that um, we know that we now know that there's a lot of influence on our DNA that ends up being sort of chemical reactions that take place in our DNA and decorations and uh, little things that that get bound to our DNA. It's all called the epigenetic or epigenomic language, and, and in fact, it's probably one of the ways that the environment and social factors influences our genetics. And we, we really don't understand, you know, we understand the DNA alphabet, it's four letters, it's just a big long string of these four letters. 
but we do not understand the language of epigenomics by any means. And it's much more complicated. It's far more than even four chemicals. And uh, you know, this is a, a grand challenge for the next decade or two. So the uh, so just to uh, just to clarify what you and I have been saying the last a few uh, minutes, that we could change any D, any DNA base pair in the genome, but we don't know necessarily, except in some selected uh, instances, what that change might result might likely result in. So this is really what the the, the conundrum would be. What we may be able to figure it out short term, but we may not even know it long term. And again, yeah. I'll just go yeah. back, you know, these unintended consequences. In yeah. fact, I mean, it's thought that Dolly the sheep was not particularly healthy because the epigenomic language of its genome had sort of gotten a little skewed through the cloning of an organism, cloning of Dolly. Since we had this one question about um, potential conflicts of interest, that also gelled with a, a other audience question that came in, uh, Maryland-based, a growing number of private clinics, including here in Maryland, offer stem cell treatments or stem cell-derived products to vulnerable populations. With the limited resources the FDA and the federal government has to offer, what should states, including Maryland, do to protect their citizens? And as I said, there seems to be um, some resonance between that and the question about potential conflict of inter interest of those organizations that are funding this kind of research. Any thoughts about, about that for, for this audience member? So I can take a stab at it. Um, for the most part, these uh, clinics are regulated by the FDA. They're regulated at the federal level. There's really not much that states are doing. And FDA primarily, somewhat FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, regulates stem cell clinics um, and claims that they make. And, and that's part of the problem that a lot of them are making false claims or unsubstantiated claims that stem cells can work miracles and cure Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and cardiovascular diseases and uh, arthritis and just a host of, uh, just a range of, of things. And, and they're not approved um, by FDA. And these are claims that, that uh, under FDA's regulatory scheme make them drugs or biologics that require pre-market approval and clinical trials. St on the other hand, um, uh, these federal agencies are really uh, resource thin and they don't have the resources they need. There, there are now hundreds of these clinics, not just, I mean, Maryland has a few, but across the country, there are hundreds of them that are making these claims and people are going to them, vulnerable people who um, believe the claims don't understand that they're not regulated uh, facilities. States are somewhat limited. They, uh, their, their boards of medicine and other um, health occupation boards that regulate providers, that if they're providing care that is um, not a uh, standard of care and is, is not approved that they can be they can be disciplined by the state licensing board. Uh, states can um, also pass laws, but they uh, can't conflict with the federal law. Uh, so there are things that that can be done uh, at the state level, but really it's it's more at the federal level. And FDA, as I said earlier, is trying to balance things with their their. You know, whatever they do, they're criticized that they're they're regulating too much and they're cutting off innovation uh, for the industry that wants to move forward on this and not have to go through the extensive and costly clinical trial process. Um, if they um, don't regulate enough, of course, they're criticized again by the academic and other scientific community that. Uh, these things are out there and, and they're actually harming people in some cases. It's not just that the, the, the therapies are ineffective or unproven. Um, and then that if they do too, uh, tighten up too much, they're, they're not letting um, patients and uh, have access to what these patients who often are desperate, some of them are terminally ill and they, are, they have no other options. So, um, I want to, I want, 
I want to just jump in there. I mean, to, to this point, the, the stem cell clinics, I mean, they, they're kind of speaking roughly some language of stem cells, but, you know, there's no stem cells particularly involved. There's no, there's no science involved. It's a, they would draw tissue from your, your, you know, your belly fat and then inject it somewhere else. I mean, it's just pure hokum, but hokum can arise anywhere, especially in a kind of regulatory gray zone. And the gray zone is that surgeons, you know, if you go to the surgeon and they need to graft skin from your arm to your face, they don't need the FDA to allow them to do that. It's just moving tissue around. So there's a regulatory space for these ridiculous claims to take shape. And I think Dr. Green earlier said, you know, hey, we don't know how to manipulate uh, your height or we don't know what is the genes of intelligence, but the IVF clinic is another space of gray regulation of the claims. And so already there are tests that people are offering for embryos to say, well, we're gonna grade your embryo by its height or its intelligence or something else. And beyond that, maybe we'll do a CRISPR. And so we're worried about stem cells now, stem cell clinics now, but I would be a lot more worried if people are meddling with you know, the genomes of embryos in ways that are also completely unproven. So are. we're worried about the ethics and you know, should you do this or should you do that? But the concrete question is like, how are we gonna not do this? Or, or what's the system for figuring out if something actually works bef before we meddle with heredity? Because to do it blindly or stupidly or as quackery, that would be a disaster. By the way, I, so I, I agree with you. I, I mean, it, it terrifies me. Um, and I, I think a significant attention should be paid to this. And to give you a preview of the kind of, um, you know, uh, quackery that's out there, just do, you know, again, in my space of just doing genomic analyses to, as, as a, or genomic tests, go do a Google search for a genomic tests. And uh, you'll find actually a, a far greater number of things that have no scientific basis you know, such as finding the right cosmetic, finding your right partner in life, finding the right sport for your child to play in, sport, you know, all these predictive things. It is just, they don't have much validity, but they offer the test. Now, of course, and that's just proximal to go in and try to do CRISPR to change something. But um, needless to say, you know, you could get a preview of what's out there by just going on the internet. And I think, I mean, FDA has to prioritize, again, with limited resources. And I think it tries to go after those things that are the highest risk, where this is the greatest amount of harm. And there have been reports for these stem cell clinics of people actually dying or going blind or having more pain than when they went into the clinic to start with. But I, I agree about the IVF critic, clinics too, and they are even less regulated. These, it, they're not so much in a gray zone, although I think historically they were. More recently they are, and certainly claims, it is quite clear that they cannot make these unsubstantiated claims. I mean, they not only they, they may not work, but they also sometimes, as you said, they don't even contain stem cells. They're not really, uh, um, uh, you don't even have in them what they, the consumer believes they have. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, there may be some ways that states can do more because the federal government is not able to act here, except in a deterrent sort of way. William, I know that you had a question. I don't know if we're ending. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if we have another half hour, just another minute. But I know you have a question about the state of Maryland, which I would like to take a shot at. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so that was the that was one of the two Maryland questions. The other was what Maryland would have to do to stay competitive in the field and attract researchers and companies, given a kind of um, a kind of gold rush uh, uh, situation where you have other states. Uh, I think the example that was cited was California has a new proposition on the ballots now to approve five point five billion in funding in this uh, in this area. So, do you have some thoughts about that, Antonio? I just want to say that as a journalist, you know, I'm always trying to f find my way to the important question or whatever, or the important news. Um, and in this area, I, I just want to make sure that the listeners understand that there's a kind of a confluence of technologies. Dr. Green's Institute brings the sort of genetics, the genetic knowledge, but then the tool CRISPR to modify the gene, to, to modify the DNA. And then the stem cell biology part comes in as a way to, you know, put that into action through a gene therapy or in a genetically modified animal. So it's this, it's this combination of several technologies leading to this practical outcome, which is very 
powerful. I mean, it, it's already powerful. Uh, Anthony, I think I said is, you know, in the lab, you can generate a, an animal with a certain disease. Um, it's already powerful there, and it's only going to get more powerful for treating disease in the future. So I just like to think of it as, you know, the sort of set of technologies that are all working together in a profound way. And like any other set of technologies, to be on top of it requires, you know, big long-term investments in, in more than one thing. And, and, and just as you said, the confluence of technologies, Tony gave the example earlier of being able to, uh, of one thing being tested now is to use those approaches to cure sickle cell. And there are many clinical trials that are now ongoing doing exactly that to see if you can use CRISPR approaches for uh, curing sickle cell. Um, in fact, highly relevant to that, there were uh, two questions. One that I want to highlight about the relationship between HIV research and techniques and insights that turn out to be useful in other disease research, including the development of a SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccine. That was one question. Um, another was, let's see here. Oh yeah, uh, the scientific, just a question again for scientific prospects. Um, what anatomical or physiological systems do you think uh, will be the most impacted by the future progress of stem, stem cell therapy? Tony's going to tell us bone marrow, and he's going to be right by saying it. At least so far, that's been the greatest progress, right, Tony? I would. Mm. Uh, you put the words right in my yeah. mouth. Although, although <laughs> retina. I mean, now retina is proving to be promising as well. Uh, so there, that, those would be ones. I think there, there, are, uh, there are some um, people that are working on finding ways to uh, activate tissues in the body to activate latent stem cells or turn them into other cells. And, and one example, and I'm not sure this is the most promising, but I think it's exciting. Uh, can you convert cells in an organ, the pancreas? So the pancreas aids in digestion. And so it has digestive enzymes that get excreted into the uh, intestine, but they also have these islets that make insulin and other hormones. And there are people that are trying to convert because with some of the dis disorders, you lose all of your islets so you can't make insulin. So can you find a way to convert some of the cells that make the digestive enzymes and convert those into cells that will make insulin? So there's an example of, you know, sort of using stem cell advances in technology to perhaps go in those directions. I think that general area is probably gonna be one that would be useful, but no doubt it's the bone marrow. You can take it out, you can manipulate it, give it back to the patient. And I think that's the way where most of the advances are gonna happen in the near future. Also, also um, uh, orthopedics, joints, uh, to, to fix uh, tears and ligaments and so forth. Um, that's being done in dogs. Actually, my Portuguese water dog, I don't know, four or five years ago, we got her a stem cell infusion in one of her joints. They took some of her stem cells out from her blood and, and it did repair it for a while and kept her uh, much more comfortable. Um, and some of those things are being tested now and I think they even mean being, being applied in, in human orthopedic uh, practices. I, just to Did add, you go to one of those clinics? We were yeah, right. Really, was that, was that a doggy stem cell clinic? <laughs> uh, it actually was. Of course, you know, it was just like you said, right? They're going to do this much more aggressively in animals before they're going to do it. And again, it was not, uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't uh, embryonic by any means. It was very limited, just to, confined to a, you know, a joint space. Let me just uh, add to the answers. Uh, I mean, the, I think the question was, what, what does the future hold? Already, we've seen the, the sort of first so they were called first gene therapy approvals had to do with cancer treatments that involved uh, gene therapy through stem cells, which is basically change a stem cell in your in your blood system to produce T cells that just wipe out uh, a specific cancer. And so in the cancers that it can be applied to, it's a it's amazing. I mean, the T cells are, you know, tend to go a little wild. So you can't target every cancer. Um, but but that sort of connection between advances in immunology um, and these other techniques is uh, already has gotten a ton of investment anyway as a, as a way to, to treat cancer. So we can hope that, uh, you know, the, the, the applications of that expand. Terrific. Diane, you want that's why to the bone marrow, oh, Excuse me. That's why the bone marrow, though, is such a, a, a fertile ground for doing these sorts of technologies, because in our life, at least in my lifetime, 
1960s, uh, a leukemia was, uh, was a diagnosis that was a, a fatal diagnosis. Now, uh, many stem cell transplant and bone marrow transplant uh, techniques where you're giving from someone else, of course, uh, can uh, be curative. And no, that wasn't the case 60 years ago. And so the things that you're talking about, Antonio, are ones that can, are being developed on top of those already um, now, you know, more standard techniques. Um, and as soon as we get more of them, uh, whether that's in orthopedics or lungs or heart, uh, someday perhaps uh, the brain, maybe we'll find some ways to apply them in those systems as well. I see those that's being way in the future though. Mm. Diane. Yeah, I was just gonna add that the, in fact, the only um, stem cell products that have been approved by the FDA are uh, blood forming stem cells derived from um, umbilical uh, cord blood. So I mean, they have a head start in some way in, in uh, having approval already. Of course, there are a number of other things in the pipeline, but nothing else has been approved yet for any other purpose. Let me ask you one final uh, uh, question from the audience. And uh, it's simply given the examples of quackery that uh, you all have pointed to, uh, where do people in fact need to go to get reliable information about the sources of, uh, of therapy that they can trust? Uh, you can trust NIH, I promise you that. You can trust NIH, but of course I'm biased. You can trust Google more than you used to. I mean, they used to allow any ad, but there's been a bit of a crackdown. So um, I think the stem cell ads for the stem cell clinics are less frequent than they used to be. I think it's a challenge of these days, though, where it, the authority of the authorities is being questioned. Uh, the experts are not the experts. Instead, it's whatever you find uh, on the internet or other things where the inside information is present. So I would say, you're, I agree with Eric, the NIH, I would think that um, going to any of the uh, uh, leading medical centers in your area, especially academic medical centers, at least you have a, a good chance of having people that are going to be using things that are approved and trying to develop new therapies in, in ethical experiments with uh, approval of institutional re review boards. So any of the therapies that you're going to get with informed consent would most likely be at places like that. That doesn't mean you only have to go to places like that, but if you're going to try you know, cutting edge uh, therapies, that would be the place to go. Certainly as I'm looking at this, the Johns Hopkins logo here, even though this is the, the, uh, the uh, uh, undergraduate campus, uh, certainly the Johns Hopkins Medical Center would be a great place to go if you were in Baltimore or, or University of Maryland would be a great place or just get on the road to the NIH. And I guess I just, I would agree with that. I think this, we are in a difficult time given all the information that uh, is out there and trying to decipher what is true and what is false is, is not easy. Um, ideally, if you have a, a physician that you trust and have had a relationship with, um, you should ask them, confer with them and get their opinion before going off to uh, try a, a new stem cell clinic uh, product or something like that. And, and also on FDA's website, they do have some good information um, and uh, information about uh, when adverse events have been reported um, related to different clinics, so. But, but you know, this does speak to, you know, issues that keep many of us up at night, which is public trust of science mm -hmm. and public trust of scientists. And, you know, I, I, you know, I have to be careful on what I can and what I should say. I'm a member of the executive branch, obviously in the federal government, but you know, these are very trying times. Um, these are very trying times um, for, for scientists and scientific leaders. I'm sure Tony feels that in academia. I feel that in the government. Um, it's, it's a, you know, we, 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 we do need to, to recalibrate some things here. We gotta get through this pandemic, but I don't think, and I think they're really we have to bring more trust to, to science than exists now. Well, and on that note, I would say that's precisely what I hope we've been doing to some degree this evening. And I wanna thank my uh, wonderful panel who's spoken to this issue with intelligence and eloquence and, uh, and, and really granted us a gift of your time and expertise on this important issue. So thank you all. It's been a great pleasure, a delight to speak to you. I know that I've uh, learned a great deal this evening. And so thank you again. 
And uh, thank you to the audience for, um, for tuning in and for sending us your questions. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Good night.